Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat about tips and tools for integrative design. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. We'll introduce our colleagues and guest speakers in just a moment, but we also wanted to let you know that today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate any written comments or questions. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll just go ahead and give a brief overview of core investments. So as we mentioned, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based CORE Investments. It's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for everyone in our county across the lifespan. The framework for CORE has evolved over several years based on input and insights we've gathered from many partners across local government, philanthropy, nonprofit agencies, and different community groups. This collaborative process led us to the core mission and vision that you see here with equity at the center. When we talk about the, uh, the possibilities for equitable health and well being, we mean that everyone across the lifespan has equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well being and that everyone's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by race, ethnicity, income, gender identity or sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other identity. So as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides a framework to align priorities, programs, policies, funding, and results around community-wide goals and to work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being that you see here. Equity is at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs, practices, and structures that perpetuate the same inequities that we're determined to eliminate. And events like today's Core Coffee Chat are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. You can think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of Core Investments, offering an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities for people across sectors to build the knowledge, the skills, and the systems that we need to fulfill this collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. So today we're going to share some um, findings, information, and process from a particular learning opportunity called the Learn, Do, Share model, which created a community of practice among several of us. You'll meet in just a moment. We'll tell you a little bit about what we learned and what we did after uh, experiencing a, a webinar together. And then we're going to share um, some of our work in progress I just want to emphasize that the, the work that we did together, we each picked a project that you'll hear about, but these are very much a draft, which is kind of the point of, of the, uh, the information to co-design something together. And then we'll just share some of the tips and tools along the way, as well as the worksheets. So we're hoping that this will inspire some of you to use some of the same tools that we learned about. But we, um, we just want to emphasize that the information that we're sharing today is still very much a work in progress. So before we do that, we wanted to do a quick poll and see whether any of you have participated in a community of practice where you learn together with other people um, outside of a school setting, let's say. So have you ever done that for work or something, maybe some uh, particular hobby or talent you have? Have you done that often, maybe occasionally once or twice? No, but it's interesting or intriguing to you or you're a, a solo thinking, yikes, I'm a community of one. I don't wanna learn in a group. So let's see what we've got. Okay, a few more moments. Well, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, since you're here together with us, we don't have any yikes, no, I'm a community of one, even though we may feel that way sometimes. 
we have a smattering of offens once or twice and 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 a no but intrigued okay great well we hope we hope we can make a pitch for this this way to learn together so the way this works the learn do share with core model is that there's a, a short-term opportunity to use what we were calling gentle accountability, meaning we can, we can nudge each other to, first of all, do the webinar together. So we all had to commit to uh, a couple hours of listening to some presenters from the um, Stanford Design School, the D School, and the Stanford Social Innovation Review about this topic of co-designing. Um, we learned something from the webinar, but then the important part of the accountability part was to actually try to practice doing it together. I don't know if you've had the experience of thinking a webinar sounds interesting or there's something to learn and then you either sign up for it and don't attend or sign up for it, kind of half listen, save the worksheets and slides somewhere um, on your computer, never to be seen again. So that's that's the idea here is that to take that interest um, and impulse to learn something new, but to actually commit to trying to use it and to and to hold each other accountable to do that. So we, we learned something, we did something, we practiced together, and today we're doing the share part, which is letting you know how this went for us in the hopes of sharing the information with you so that you can do the same. We had a, a pilot of this um, with CORE when we did a storytelling with data version of this, and we hope to do this again. So keep keep your eyes out for um, trying to learn, learn more with us. And if, you, and if you have topics to suggest or something that looks interesting in this same vein, let us know that as well. So the um, cohort who you'll meet in just a moment are on this, um, this slide shot from one of our practice sessions. Um, you can see that we um, we were having a good time trying to uh, trying to practice together. And we um, we are very eager to share what we learned because we all learned something different. We all we came from different um, topics and different sectors. And we um, we had a, a chance to really experiment together and, and in a short amount of time over the last couple months, but I hope that you'll agree that we did get somewhere with our learning here, our, our, our community of practice. So we'll do a quick um, share of what the, the gist of the webinars was about. So the Stanford D School's Designing for Social Systems Program and Webinars had this question, how can we benefit from the exploratory and human-centered nature of design while being clear in our purpose, grounded in justice and equity, and seeing the broader systems that affect our cause? So you can see why that was of interest to many of us. And as we learned from the, the webinar hosts, design is a mindset and an approach for creative problem solving and what they're calling problem finding. So it's exploratory by definition, and they're seeing design as an approach to move forward, even when we don't know exactly how to reach the change we seek. We can use design to gain understanding and to uncover new possibilities and new solutions. So it's just, it's really um, tempting. Some of us have been trained to um, really have a lot of certainty in order to move forward. And so some of us have to unlearn that and have this and open up a space for really having this, um, this exploration and, and uh, journey of, as they're calling it, problem solving and problem finding that doesn't rely on knowing everything before you set out. It's really about being open to, um, to learning new things. And integrative design um, combines some different methodologies. Human-centered design, so that's the, the process and mindset and approach to identifying some meaningful challenges and being creative about solving complex problems. That guides um, practitioners to understand and respond to the needs of specific people, to question our assumptions, which you'll see is a very important part of this, to reframe problems and to experiment to advance solutions. 
It also includes um, systems thinking. So that's helping us to take a step back and visualize the, the systems that we're all working in, identifying the relationships between stakeholders and determining where there's some greater leverage to, to act and actually have um, an impact within systems and across systems. It also includes some elements of strategic planning. And those are the pieces that help uh, or orient us within some broader context and identify some more immediate interventions given whatever an organization's resources might be. And then of course, we're grounded in a commitment to address equity and anti-racism because we know that the social sector challenges are shaped by inequity. So um, there's active structural oppression, exclusion, discrimination, um, and, and how a team works, the, the process must be equitable to create these possibilities to create more equitable outcomes. So this is very consistent with how we think about the core conditions for health and well-being. Um, it involves both reflection and relational work. So just really wrestling with these issues of racism, of identity, of equity, and that these are really the, the prerequisites to bringing about positive social change. So that's very uh, quick tour of some of these elements of integrative design um, that were part of this approach. And you can see in the chat an article where you can see more about, about the um, definitions of these and how they all work together. So in the webinar, we were asked to select a project to focus on where there's still some unknowns, some exploratory work to be done, and then to do some initial pre-work about our thoughts and assumptions. So again, this was not meant to be a fully baked project plan. And we had some tools that they offered us to use as we did this. So they wanted us to think about um, what we could, what, what would be the ultimate outcomes we wanted to seek, some intermediate outcomes, and then some solutions for how we get there. And so Nicole Young, who, who is um, experiencing a bout of laryngitis, so I'm going to be try to be her voice today, um, selected a project on trying to expand home visiting in Santa Cruz County, or in, this could be any county. And this was really just to test the feasibility of this. Is it, is it needed? Is it possible? Um, if so, what, what would this actually accomplish? So in her pre-work, she did this brief description of the project that you see here. So it's to, just to determine whether this would work and, and if so, how, and then the result would be to make a recommendation one way or the other for whether or not to expand home visiting to those who might be um, supporting and funding this. And I'll pause for just a moment. And then you'll see all this laid out in just a moment in, in a couple of different ways, but then we were asked to consider what is a solution or effort that we would produce or implement, and that's called the vehicle. And then there would be something that's an, an intermediate outcome. So not, not the solution, like implementing this program, but the impact that's created by the solution. And they're in the Stanford um, design world, they're calling this the near star. And then there's a guiding star. That's the ultimate outcome, the, the ideal state that you're trying to get to. So the near star that we just discussed, the intermediate outcome, is a really significant step getting towards that goal. So in this home visiting example, the vehicle was to expand the availability and the array of evidence-based culturally responsive home visiting programs for a particular population, for pregnant and parenting families with young children. And the intermediate outcome or near star is to improve the health, economic and early learning outcomes for these families that we just described. And the ultimate outcome is for all children and families to have equitable opportunities to fulfill their goals and dreams. So this home visiting program is the vehicle to get to those near and guiding stars.
And this is the same information in Spanish. I just didn't want to cram it all on one slide. I'll give you a moment to review that. Okay. And so this shows you some of the elements that we just listed in the pre-work just in a different way. So you can see at the top, there's the guiding star. That's the, the change that you want to see in the world. Then there's the, the near star, the change in the system, the significant step towards that guiding star. And that is shaped by the insights and understandings that we have of the system. And it tells us where we can act to be most effective. And then there's a path to get there. And that's the change for people in their experiences and their behaviors. So how are, how are people affected to reach that near and guiding star? And what insights and understandings do we have about that? So it's the idea is that you, um, you have to affect people in order to have an effect on these systems. This is a place where we found in our pre-work that we'll share with you, where you might need to do some exploratory work that's different from what you might, might have thought at the outset. Then there's a vehicle that you introduce as a change. So this could be an intervention or a program. And this is something that you're, you're testing in this model. And you're trying to see if your efforts are leading to that change that you're trying to achieve with the near and guiding stars. And again, this is telling you what you think you want to build. And it's an opportunity to change your ideas about what that might be. And again, through exploratory work and really questioning your assumptions. And you, I think you'll hear in our examples, each of us really went through some changes in how we thought about this, which is the whole point of having this design journey. And then finally, there's a home base that shows the resources and relationships um, that you have available to make these changes. So they could be things like your current staff, the programs that you have in place, the partnerships that you have to make this happen, um, funding streams, knowledge and expertise, um, insights. And this slide shows how Nicole thought about these pieces, the guiding and near stars, the path, the vehicle, and the home base for this particular example of expanding a home visiting program. So this is just to give you an idea of when you are in practice, we were, we were jotting this down on a piece of paper while we're listening to the webinar, and then we're continuing to refine it as we go along. And that TBD that you see in the, the block for the path, the change for people, that's a really important piece of this, the to be determined, because it's reminding us that we don't know a lot of these things until we ask. So a big, big part of this design process, as you'll hear, is to really remind ourselves that we need to question what we know and be open to learning new things. And here it is again in Spanish. The next thing that we had to do in the webinar was to look at framing and scoping. And so in, in human-centered design, this idea of ethnography and experimentation, as I mentioned, trying to really think about um, who does and does not have a voice in what you're doing, what you learn from the people most affected by your interventions is really important. And scoping is how you'll do this. So it's not just solving the problem on your own or coming up with things, although it's fine to, to uh, try to be creative and think about those things, but really to, uh, to think about the other input that you need, the things that you don't know, as well as the things that you think you do know. So the prompts that they gave us to do this were to think about the shift that we want to bring about, the change, and to they, they gave us some really helpful um, sentences that you'll see again. So for example, I want to create 
a way for people to do X. So this, I mean, it could be your near star, uh, which is more like a systems change, or it could be something much more specific, but it's not yet the, the solution itself. It's the, the change that you're hoping to bring about. And then the other piece is for whom you're trying to make this change. For what group of people are you designing this? And the materials really helped us um, think about narrowing the focus to a very specific user group. So even if you wanted to affect a broader group of people, like teachers, for example, this prompts you to think about, is it something like new teachers in our district or teachers in a particular school system or area? So again, lots of um, nudging to try to be really specific and to um, narrow our focus in order to be more useful. So the starter phase is for whom, for which specific group, while also considering a broader group. So for in Nicole's example with the home visiting expansion, you had uh, parents, pregnant and parents of young children, zero to five, but ultimately while keeping in mind the needs of all parents. And then there was something they called the crux. So this is when it comes right down to it, what exactly are you trying to figure out? Why are you using this exploratory process? What's not already known and obvious to you? So it could be an assumption that you need to test or some other unknown that you want to explore. And the starter phrase for this one was, we really need to figure out blank. And so you'll hear that in some of the examples that we're about to share in a moment. And that they had really good advice to try to limit our questions and assumptions here to three to keep it manageable, because you can go, as you can imagine, generating a pretty broad list of these, these questions about what's not already known. So these are the, just, this is a very quick tour of something that was actually presented and practiced over several hours. Um, but just to give you some of the language and the, the frameworks that we were tasked with um, using together. And so that when you see these phrases, the crux and we need to figure this out and the near star and the guiding star, you'll have a sense of what we were trying to do. And we had worksheets that we'll share with you and other materials, but we all approach this in a slightly different way as you'll hear in just a moment. But before we go to the examples from the people in our, uh, our learn do share circle, we wanted to see if there are some questions that you may have for us. So this is just a summary of of how this works. So we have the change for whom and the crux all together. And this is the example that Nicole had for the home visiting expansion. And you can see that here, the shift that they're trying to bring about is that you saw that early on was trying to create ways to expand the availability and the array of these programs for the pregnant and parenting families while considering the, the needs of, of all of them, the ones who have the socio, socioeconomic challenges that make them particularly vulnerable, but for all families that struggle in different ways at different times who might need some support. And then the crux is really to figure out what do these pregnant and parenting families really need and want? It may be different from what we think they need and want. And are home visiting programs the best fit for responding to those needs and wants? And then if it is the best fit, we still don't know what might lead families to participate or what are some of the barriers that might get in their way. And there's the same information in Spanish. Okay. So what questions do you have for us? Feel free to raise your hand or ask something in the chat and we will do our best to, uh, to answer your questions as relatively new learners of this ourselves. Any questions so far? 
We, we just threw a lot of information at you. I'm not seeing any hands up. Oh, Kaki, go ahead. Let me unmute myself here. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, this good is morning. really interesting. It it parallels other design pro you know design approaches that I use. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. And so, um, my question about my question is about the questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, Great. And um, so, so let's say we come into this situation. What what I what I maybe I missed it, but I never really saw a problem statement. What are the issues? What are the circumstances? What are the things we're running into in our community that we're trying to change? Did, did I miss that when I had to step away for a couple of minutes, or? Did that not? You know, happen? it's a good point, Kaki. It's not it's not pulled out or called that. And it's sort of embedded in the elements that you see going through here. So let me see if I can back up to the, the slide with the. Um, let me share this one. Because when I'm always uh, reminded of that uh, Albert Einstein quote where he says, if I had an hour to solve the problems of solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes figuring out what the problem was. And th this is, it looks like, I mean, this looks like a process to figure out what the problem is in a way, but um, yeah. So, so what, what this is trying to, to get you to do, I believe, and, and others, please chime in, um, is to think about things, not just in terms of problems, but in terms of shifts, so changes mm -hmm. for people, mm -hmm. changes in systems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are um, those require uh, circumventing or dismantling um, things that we would call problems. Yeah, but not always. And so I, you know, I think it's trying to step away from labeling things as mm -hmm. just purely problems, um, mm -hmm. and perhaps um, leading to a more creative or strength based. Um, definition of change so that changes yeah. um and and that changes and maybe i'm reading too much into it um stem from the the that they should the the insights about what needs to be changed and how and what's feasible should be much more tightly connected to the people affected by those changes yeah yeah so if we kind of start with the guiding star the near star and basically we're coming in with a hypothesis, a hypothesis that home visits might be helpful in improving the health, economic, and early learning outcomes of pregnant and parenting families. Um, and that's why we're saying, okay, if, if what, that's what we want, then what will pregnant and parenting families tell us that will help them get to that? And then we work backwards from that and design our intervention to uh, help us get there. Yeah. And another, I think that's right, um, Kaki. And the, the other thing that I would point to is the, the column here on the right, the crux, mm -hmm. which says when it comes down to it, what are you trying to figure out? Yeah. We, we don't actually know that home visiting programs are the best way to address whatever struggles these families are facing. Yeah. So for One example, question, when you say what leads parent, families to participate, when you, when you talk about participation, do you mean like access resources that are in the community? Or do you mean like be a, be a member of their local school site council? To, to participate in a home visiting program. So, okay. okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So That's for example, um, just anecdotally, some families that are struggling would benefit from having someone come to their home and help them learn about child development and have access to other resources. But some families don't want somebody in their home, especially somebody official, um, and may feel some shame or um, or just just want privacy about, about how they're running their, their home and their family. 
And so there might be barriers that, you know, that, that an, an agency might think, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could help this family with a person who shows up and gives you resources and tips and works with you to uh, reassure you about what's normal for a child this age or not. Um, but that may not be perceived that way by right. somebody who's, right. who's um, receiving that service. And so this is just trying to say, we don't, we don't actually know as much as we should about whether home visitings are home visiting programs are the way um, to to provide that support. So we, we may still want to provide support, but maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's something where um, there's an intermediary who's a trusted other parent. I'm really just making this up at the moment, but yeah, but um, no, but that's the, the points that you're raising about what's perceived as a problem and what's the solution to the problem. Um, this approach that the design, the integrative design approach is really trying to get us to question whether we, whether we should go very far down the design road, program design road or intervention design road without really asking ourselves, why do we think that? Why do we think this will work? Why do we think it will be accepted and useful? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Anything to add? Nicole, do you want to say anything in the chat? That No? Okay. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Okay, maybe we should move on to our examples. Let me let slides catch up so nobody gets dizzy. Okay, I am really excited to get to this point in our presentation, not just because I get to stop talking <laughs> and you get to hear some other voices, but really because this, this is my biased opinion, but I'm just so proud of our little cohort and the things that we came up with, um, that they came up with. So you're going to hear from um, several people now in succession, and I'll introduce each of them. Um, so the first person you'll hear from is Vivian Rogers, who's the development director at Santa Cruz Shakespeare. And from each of them, you'll hear a brief description of the project and how they handled the same kind of pre-work that we've just previewed with home visiting. You'll hear a little bit about their strategy snapshot. So those guiding and near stars, the path, the vehicle, the home base, and then that framing and scoping challenge of what change you seek for whom and the crux of what you still need to know. And most importantly, a couple of takeaways that they each had that are all different because their projects were different about the any tools or tips they might have if you wanna try this at home. So, um, and then we'll have a chance for questions for them at the end as well. So they'll you'll each give a brief um, overview and we'll move through them at a pretty brisk clip. So try to save your questions for, um, for the end and then we'll, and we'll also have a chance to practice this um, together yourselves. So stay tuned, but first up, Vivian, take it away. Morning, everyone. So yeah, I'm the development director with Santa Cruz Shakespeare. And uh, the project I chose came from, in the fall of 2020, the board and the staff and some of the actors of Santa Cruz Shakespeare, we went through a DEI training. And afterwards, uh, we our mission statement talks about uh, sharing stories to that are common in all our communities. And we realized internally that we weren't reaching a lot of the communities in Santa Cruz County. Um, so we wanted to figure out a way to include more, commu more, more communities coming to the theater. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So the when I did the preliminary work before going through this presentation, I kind of took what we were already thinking about. And we thought, uh, well, producing a holiday show in the Watsonville's Mellow Center would be one way to get there. This is a vehicle so we can do it. Um, creating the, the, the near star, that was actually really good for me because I think we weren't very... Um, 
focused at Santa Cruz Shakespeare. But when I thought of it before going through this presentation, so I thought, well, we're trying to increase partnerships with a diversity of art groups in Watsonville so that, you know, the, the, the ultimate thing would be that more individuals in South County would attend our season performances. And I was thinking, you know, the holiday show would be the way to it. Um, and so the next slide. But then after getting all the sort of the creating the snapshot and getting some of the prompts, um, the guiding star, uh, you know, to focus everybody, um, I came up with, you know, Santa Cruz Shakespeare would produce seasonal productions that interest and attract other communities in our region. Um, and the nearest star would be uh, that we could focus on bringing in more individuals' interest from South County so that they would want to attend Santa Cruz Shakespeare productions. So the change for people and those prompts uh, really made me start thinking about the questions we needed to answer before we could get there. And some of them that came up to me, um, came up to, to my attention was like, what does storytelling mean to different groups in Watsonville? And um, do, do even like some of the performing art groups that are exist in Watsonville, do they even see Santa Cruz Shakespeare, Shakespeare as, a, as a partner? Uh, so this is where more of my attention came to you. And I think that Santa Cruz Shakespeare needs to go on a listening tour or something. But then, then the change, you know, could be a holiday show in Watsonville, but then I thought from the change in the prompts from before, we might learn something that um, would produce a different kind of show that incorporates new partnerships and interests in South County. And in looking into our resources and everything, we are partners with the uh, Santa Cruz Arts Community Council, um, the director of um, Artes del Valle del Pajaro. She volunteers with us in one of our uh, community programs. Our marketing manager is Spanish speaking and bicultural. And one of the best resources we do have for other people is we have an outdoor theater that can fit up to 500 people, which smaller groups probably would love to use just because they don't have access to. So you can then change it to the next slide. Um, and after coming up with the prompts and some of their very directed questions, I came up that we had Santa Cruz Shakespeare you know, we need, in the first few steps, we need to increase our partnerships with those living and working in Watsonville so that eventually attract them to our performances. And probably the first groups that we would start with are maybe those who already attend our performance and trying to figure out what are the interests of the South County performance groups when, you know, for, for us to be involved with them. And, you know, in, in the, in essence, what would happen is we would attract many more individuals from South County to um, our community stories or our productions. So you can go to the next slide. So I, you know, one of the, I have two points here, but I realized that one of the most important points was the guiding star. Even at the very beginning, when they said the guiding star, I realized that creating a guidance star would help focus all of us so that the board and the staff weren't all going in different directions trying to reach the same ultimate star. But then going through, what was really worthwhile was going through these different stages and their different prompts because they came out the same question with different ways and it made me really think uh, at, at, at different points as to what I'm trying to do. Um, and also something that came out through the presentations, uh, the web webinar, uh, the other people, they had listening tours or they would do interviews and they discovered so many different things in their original hypothesis and um, led them to more successful paths through that. So the listening tours, I think, are very important. Thanks, Vivian. I hope that gave you a sense of how one project worked through these questions and changed along the way, which is the whole idea. And now we're gonna hear from Heather Willoughby, who's an advocate for students with dependents. Heather, go Hi, ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so I um, I based my project um, on a theoretical 
um, a, a project that I don't actually have in the works quite yet, but it's something that I'm hoping to pitch in the future. And so, um, so I think for me, I had a little bit more of a difficult time really like scoping things down and making sure that I had um, the right approach for the most part. But um, yeah, my project's name was CalWorks Association Expansion Project. And it is a project that basically would expand um, the the wraparound services that you get from uh, CalWorks Association and the community colleges um, into the four-year universities um, in California. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my, my intervention, my vehicle was, you know, basically this the same as my project um to do the expansion um and i really wanted to make sure that we were creating a new pathway for increasing um access to higher education and and make it so that uh, student or uh students that are doing the educational pathways in CalWORKs Association or in CalWORKs ex itself um, really had an opportunity to get to a higher earnings point than just, um, you know, a, a certificate or a two-year degree. And my my guiding scar, star was uh, to make a public higher education more family-friendly and a better lever for economic investment. Give you a second with the... So in this strategy snapshot, um, basically, you know, I went from, I had a, a really hard time with this worksheet originally, um, mostly because I, I really wasn't sure how I was going to get this project completely started. I had some ideas, but um, it wasn't really fully fleshed out. Um, but I do know that, um, you know, my, my home base was I was going to have these institutional stakeholders um, and that I would create a research team that would intersect with um, the research team that the CalWORKs Association has on um, funded in their their campuses. And that I wanted to create a program that um, my, my vehicle is that I wanted to create a, a similar program that was modeled after um, those services. And um, can we go back to the other slide, sorry. And then, yeah, I wanted to, my my path was to build these partnerships, do the research and identify needs, design the bridge program, have a pilot program and evaluate and, and iterate and scope up. And so um, I had these near stars of a one year pilot program and then a five year more established throughout the UC and then also some of the UC CSU systems. And my guiding star was to foster inclusive and equitable higher education system that facilitates uh, the successful transitions from community college to a four year. And next slide, please. So yeah, in framing, in the framing part in this, this sort of change, um, I really wanted to reproduce program that I know already exists in the Cal or in the community colleges that I know already has like the basis for helping these students through an educational system. And then this is specifically for uh, CalWORKs uh, recipients that are pursuing the educational pathway. And then my crux, which, you know, I ended up having a hard time with as well, um, really was to figure out um, if we build this, will they come, you know, our ETS workers, the education or the, uh, employment training specialists, are they suggesting this is a viable approach? Um, and is a four-year de degree enough to pull a family out of poverty and over the fiscal cliff? And then also, how do we get institutional buy-in that um, will make long-term programmatic funding mechanisms possible? Thank you. Next slide. So in this process, really, I felt like I was really such um, a new kind of like person to this uh, human centered design that it was, it was definitely very challenging for me, but I definitely felt that um, watching the webinars and also um, doing the 
the talk it out with everybody else really helped me to really figure out more to pull in deeper to like the things that I wanted to, to, to really have in the project and my why is for the project. Um, so, uh, yeah, my tips and takeaways were it was hard <laughs> at first, but it was really great working with uh, others to like figure the stuff out. And then also, um, by working with others, I was able to, um, uh, the, you'll hear later from Rob, who used the generative AI, I was able to go back and check out the generative AI that he had um, utilized and really kind of reform my stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. So another example of working through this, and thanks for being so candid about the fact that it was a struggle. It was a struggle in different ways for all of us. And so don't be deterred by that if you try this yourself. Um, it, it does reward a little bit of persistence and, and thinking through this. Um, We'll hear more from now from Crystal Caballero, who's going to give us some insights from her work um, in public health at the Health Services Agency. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Crystal Caballero. I work with Santa Cruz County Public Health. And for this work, we were asked to pick ideally a systems, well, yeah, systems change work. So I picked a project that is already sort of up and running, but we're still in an iterative phase of quality improvement and building it out and making it sustainable. And that project is what we call Park RX Santa Cruz County. And it's a multi-sector upstream initiative. We convene parks, healthcare, community to promote uh, the prescription of parks and recreation um, services as key drivers of health and equity. Next slide, please. So I don't have all of the worksheet slides to share with you all, um, but I did want to share this framing worksheet. So the system change we're looking at for Park RX Santa Cruz County is to create ways for all community members with low incomes to receive a medical prescription for free park and recreation programs to benefit their health. It's a mouthful. Um, and really for who, as I mentioned, it's for community members with lower incomes who are uninsured or on Medi-Cal, while also considering the systems that serve them, right? So the medical providers and the healthcare systems and also the park professionals that serve them. And we really need to figure out um, at the get-go and continuing so, what are the barriers? Why isn't this already happening, right? We found that there's so much interest within the community and the professionals involved but why isn't it already happening, right? So what are the barriers to preventing folks? Um, so not only that, but really what are the barriers to preventing folks who, are, who we mentioned are low income uninsured on Medi-Cal from utilizing park and outdoor programs for their health? And as I also said, what are the barriers for the professionals within the system? Healthcare providers, staff, like the technology involved, and also the park professionals. Thank you. And next slide, whenever you're ready. My uh, presentation to you is a little short, um, but I did want to say that uh, a lot of times my role in public health or our role is to bring data and evidence to programs um, and to initiatives and collaborations. And in digging into the tools and talking with others and listening to the webinars, I really, it, it really, really, really drilled down into me that designing with and for isn't something that's going to make our program shiny or better, but it is the process, right? We need to design with and for. And so I'm walking away with how can I continue to wrap that into my profession as a public health professional um, to really bring in the voice of community and design with and for. So slowing down to connect and driving more impact. Um, and continuing to ask, right, and Nicole mentioned um, earlier that we're not doing this on our own, right? We're not solving the problem on our own. And in reflecting and thinking through these tools, I realized how much, you know, I have the data, right? I have these tools and I want this to happen because I know that parks and recreation can lead to XYZ health outcomes. But that's not enough, right? I'm not solving it. I'm not solving these problems on my own. So I always need to keep asking, always pausing, who is this solution and program for, right? And how have they been involved in coming up with this solution or program or intervention? So it's not just coming from me. 
And um, last tip, more ethnography, more stories, more connection. So I'm really looking forward to utilizing these tools um, as we come back to the table for this project and continue to scale out to other clinics and also other counties and other communities are asking um, for us to help them um, bring up their ParkRx programs. And so this is something I'm really taking away is starting with the community um, ourselves as we build out. And that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Crystal. That's great. Appreciate that example and, and also these really helpful tips and takeaways. And I think you can see there's some similarities and also some differences in how we all approach these. And now we're going to hear from Rob Doty, who is a juvenile justice consultant. And as Heather previewed, he's also, in addition to sharing his journey with this, he's going to tell us a little bit about using yet another tool um, from the world of artificial intelligence. Rob, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm Rob Doty, and I'm, uh, as Nicole had said, I'm a juvenile justice consultant, and I'm working on uh, a variety of different projects around the state and locally here in Santa Cruz County. So when I had an opportunity to be involved in this project, I was I was sort of curious to see if I could take something that we're currently working on here in Santa Cruz and actually apply it to this practice and go through this process to see where where this would take us. And I can tell you um, that it was a very interesting um, uh, process for me to go through to apply something that is sort of in the works right now, something that uh, we're meeting with with uh, different folks in the county. And, and really to see uh, by putting this and going through a different process than I thought and in, in the direction that we are going, uh, just to see what would happen. And so for me, it's been a very eye-opening experience and that's what I'm gonna share with you today. So real quickly, the project that I'm working on is increasing networks of support uh, for system-involved youth in Santa Cruz County. And really the just a brief description is we're trying to uh, identify networks of support for youth as early as possible. We're trying to do a shared approach with our system partners. And really we're trying to increase the amount of input we get from youth and families and what kind of support they need. Next slide, please. So as been has been mentioned previously, um, one of the tools that this project uh, provided for us in the cohort was to experiment with a generator, generative AI process and utilize an AI chatbot to help us identify a scope of work. So this is something that I hadn't ever experimented with before. It's something that we hadn't really done in the work that we'd been doing in the county. And so for me, this was a really, um, you know, I was I was excited to try this uh, AI uh, approach and work with this chat bot to see what, what it would come up with. And so what I'm gonna describe for you in the next handful of slides is sort of this experience that Stanford provided for us, the, the, the design program provided for this cohort and just sort of my experience with this, because it was brand new to me, I've been doing this work for a lot of years, and I never used AI, like probably most of us. So in the very first slide, you can see where Scopy, the chatbot, um, introduces uh, themselves and um, basically starts out with, what kind of change am I trying to make? Next slide. And so that's when um, it's basically fell in the blanks. Um, it's really not that much more uh, critical or com complex. Um, at, at this point, it's filling in the blanks and it's responding. So I basically just wrote in, I'm trying to create ways to increase networks of support for youth that are system involved. Next slide. And then Scopy, as you can see by these slides, you'll see the yellow arrow and you'll see sort of the uh, reddish arrow. Um, this is sort of the interaction and that's what we were trying to capture for you 
to show you how this can really develop a scope of work really for any project. So then Scopey would just ask, um, for whom are you trying to design this, this project? Who, who's your target audience? I basically wrote, right now we're looking at system-involved youth. That's youth that are either in dependency or juvenile justice and between the ages of 12 and 18 or 12 to 21. Scopey then gets, gets that information um, and then we'll say, so why? Why, why is this important? Who's this important to? And so then that really gets you thinking about, okay, who is, who is this important to? So it's the sort of this is an expansion of my thought process going into this was to really be able to respond to all of the questions, not knowing what the questions were going to be. So I said, uh, we believe, and I believe, increasing networks of support uh, will really increase opportunities for pro-social activities and expand connections to the community. It's our goal in this work that we hope it will also reduce the likelihood of future system involvement. So I write that response. Scopey then will come back and say, okay, let's talk about the assumptions. What are you trying to test? So that made me think about, okay, what are the one or two things that I'm trying to either have answered or we've made assumptions? Are those assumptions true? So my, my response was, does increasing networks of support for youth and families result in improved outcomes? Does it earlier identification of these networks make a difference over time? So I had to really think about if I could ask in, in, two questions to, to really kind of test my work, what would they be? And so then I submitted this. And then <clears throat> Scopey comes back and says, okay, let's more specifically define. So as I noticed working in the with the AI chatbot, I would give a response. I would wait literally 15, 20 seconds at the longest. And Scopey would come back with going one step further, making me making me think even further than I thought I was going to have to. So in this particular question, going back to, let's define the change you're trying to create. Um, and in this particular instance, it's how will you measure this in uh, improvement in support? And how do these changes translate into the outcomes you're looking for? So as you all know, outcomes are critical to a project. And this was Scopey's way of like introducing me, getting me to think about outcomes. So just really quickly in my response, I thought, well, how about if we try to measure the number of enduring relationships as youth entered the system and then periodically measure the same number or how many, hopefully how many have we added in enduring relationships that have been built and built through intentional work by system partners. That would be an outcome that we'd be very interested in. So I wrote that. And then <clears throat> Scopey thought about it for 15, 20 seconds, wrote me back and says, okay, let's go back to who you're trying to work with. And what in particular uh, about these youth uh, has been brought to your attention to make part of this project? Are there specific challenges or experiences? So I had to think about, well, what, what are we trying to solve? What is, what is the benefit of doing this work? And the benefit is that kids who are system involved typically have higher levels of academic challenges. They're typically involved in fewer pro-social activities, and they've often been stigmatized by their system involvement. So we, and, and finally, one of the one thing I wanted Scopey to consider and then give me a response to is that most of the kids that are system involved, unfortunately have experienced far more incidents of early childhood trauma. So I submitted that to Scopey. Scopey then comes back and says, now let's take a deeper dive into the why. You mentioned the potential benefits, but can you elaborate more on how these changes would impact youth, families, and the community? So really, I just looked at this kind of bigger picture. I said, if, the, if we can make some connections and we can build networks of support, it, it's our belief that there, there will be much more healthier connections to the community. 
and youth will feel supported by those they've identified their network of support versus system partners. That would have long-term implications in a positive way. So I submitted that. Scopey says, okay, thank you for your insights on your target group. So Scopey's really working you through this AI chatbot, is really working through and asking you to think about questions, maybe even the same question, but it's asked in a different way to really get to what eventually will be the crux of the matter. So in this case, you can see, let's look at the where. Why are you picking Santa Cruz County? What is specific to your geographical focus? It's getting back to the where, the when, the why, the whom. So in this case, I just said, I think we can have we can get some results because our county's small compared to other counties, compared to Santa Clara County, uh, Alameda County, San Francisco County. We're a very small county. That gives us opportunities to track information, to make change, to we don't have to take on a much bigger, broader system. And so I share that with Scopey. Scopey comes back and says, okay, it's clear your project has significant implications for improving the lives of youth and families. Lastly, let's discuss design questions and assumptions. This is an excellent start. We can further dissect this. What kind of human experiences or behaviors do you need to explore and understand in order to answer these questions? And that's really sort of where I started moving towards the crux of this work, going back to what the other what the others in the cohort had already talked about, the process, the forms that we use, the model that we used. And I said, well, I think in this situation, what we need to consider is how do families perceive support? What types of support do they value? And what barriers are there to accessing this support? Again, this is going towards what's stopping us from, from doing this? Next. Great. These are thoughtful, empath empathetic questions that aim to understand experiences um, and underlying the needs of families. So to summarize, this is this is the very end of the process. So I worked with Scopey on this. We went back and forth, back and forth. I just provided information, but he but Scopey made me think about it over and over. But in the end, Scopey kicks out two different with what I have shared in two different slides. The change the whom, the where, the why, and design questions and assumptions. And, and really got me thinking in a way that we hadn't thought of after 12 months of doing our group work. There were things that came up in, in this time that I spent with Scopey that we hadn't yet either considered, thought of, in a year's worth of work. Although we'd met three times uh, with our county partners, some of the ideas that Scopey popped out here and provided, uh, we hadn't really talked about in our three different meetings with our county partners. So that really uh, quickly is my experience with Scopey. And then to go back to the design forms, what, what we really were doing was looking at the change, the for whom, and the crux. I was able to really re- I was able to think about that experience with, with the AI chatbot and then really apply it to these three questions. And for me, you know, create ways to increase networks of support that are recognized as their networks of support. And finally, the the crux of this was what what can we do? What what are we doing more of? What should we do less of? what's working, what's not working. It's really examining our current practices and, and kind of going through a process like this, I think allows us to do that. Rob, thank you so much, um, both for the the tour of Scopey and for trying Scopey in the first place. It, it took um, some, some bravery with no um, AI experience to just launch into that. And we're so glad you took screenshots so that we could do that journey with you. Yeah, I just I'll just say this real quickly. I just I wouldn't I did not expect uh, using AI anytime soon in the work that that I do. But I'm I'm really glad to have had that experience uh, at this point. So thank you. Well, thank you. So I imagine some of you have specific questions for our presenters, and we did want to give you a chance to practice this as well while we're all together. 
So let's start with your questions. Anything specific? <laughs> he wants Scopey. Yes. <laughs> So as Nicole mentioned in the chat, um, it's not available yet, but we imagine they went through all this trouble so that it will be available sometime soon. Um, and we we were um, we didn't realize when we signed up for this that we were going to be offered this little um, tool that that they were testing as well. And so we got to be part of this beta test. Um, but I think the whole point was to make it more widely available, and we'll certainly keep everyone posted once it is. And and Rob, do, do I detect a little bit of affection for Scopey in your in your voice? Absolutely, uh, you do. And I and I I got to tell you, I don't I don't know that I was really a believer, or I was a little bit of like I'm concerned about what AI does or doesn't do. But in 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 the work that a lot of us do, where we're asked to build a scope of work, whether it be for a contract, for a purchase order, for a project, I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate at all to go back to an AI chatbot, a trusted one. Um, and certainly in this case, uh, the experience was was really, really great. And and I think if I had to build scope, a scope of work in the future, that's really maybe the first place I'd go. You still have to have the information to provide. It, it's not like you can say, here's my topic. I need a, I need a scope of work by in 30 minutes. That doesn't happen, but in an hour or so, if you have all the information at your at your hands that you're looking for, and and Scopey will prompt that if if you're not answering the question, Scopey will ask the question two or three more times to get to the to get you to think about what it is you're trying to get. So it comes back to you eventually anyway. You're not giving all the work and responsibility to a chatbot, but but it's a good partnership because what chatbot sends back to you, you may not have thought of. There were several things I hadn't really focused on that I said, oh, that, that's excellent. That's great, Rob. Thanks. And it makes me realize why that word generative, generative is part of generative AI. It really is generating based on what you tell it. And very quickly, those 15, 20 seconds, that's impressive. Other questions that you may have for any, any of us? I did want to add to Rob's um, statement. Um, basically, I feel like um, Scopey really gave me a chance to like almost reduce administrative burden that I think that you know a lot of NGOs or or nonprofits like really have, um, and even you know governmental um, operations have have issues with um, you know having that where do I have the bandwidth to do another project or do another grant or do another thing? And really Scopey just made it like really easy. And in the end, like, I feel like I could have taken what Scopey refined for me and just plug it into a PowerPoint and like be ready to pitch. Um, that's how like confident I kind of felt with um, how I was, how I was working with it. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. I have to admit, I haven't done anything like that either. And so um, it's it's good to have some experiences to go by and your your confidence in it. Any other questions, Scopey related or not? We have a we have a few minutes together. Um, so please do if you think of questions for any of the presenters um, on any of this, please feel free to share in the chat. And we'll do our best to address them. But meanwhile, if you wanted to try this yourself, if you have a project in mind as you were listening to all this, um, we have an option to do that. And this is just what we were asked to do in our work um, as we listened to the webinar, was to just start jotting down, you know, what's what are some of the things that, um, that you might consider as the near and guiding stars and as the vehicle for getting to them. So that was one thing we were asked to do and you can see the results from our presentations. There it is in Spanish. Whoops. Go back to the English, wrong direction, sorry. So does anybody wanna spend a few minutes trying this? Do you have a project in mind where you might wanna feel brave and, sh and share some ideas with us. 
maybe you already have. Let's give it just a couple minutes to contemplate this, and then we'll see if anybody wants to share an idea. And don't worry, just start somewhere. It doesn't, doesn't have to be perfect or even feasible. Just This is just to, to play with this tool. will be scopy for you. Another way to think about this is just is there something that you're working on or thinking about working on that would benefit from this exploratory work, the things that you wonder about? What if, what if we did this? What, what if we knew more about X? What if we understood more about this? What would be in that kind of realm? Are we just thinking or is this discussion, Nicole? Uh, both. Do you want to just, if you have something that you want to share with the group or sure. questions to ask, go ahead. Um, signing up for Cal AIM to do case management. Um, okay. So I don't know, solution, like just to start with, to keep it simple for this, um, just case management as the first intervention, if that's appropriate or yeah. trying to work out what goes into that box. Um, and then intermediate, um, getting engagement, building rapport, getting people signed up, further goal, actually improving health outcomes. Exactly, yeah. And so, um, so Serge, the, the idea for case management in general and specific to, um, to the Cal AIM work is to have this vehicle, in this case, a case manager who connects people to resources and therefore improves outcomes for them. So it's trying trying to make sure that somebody who needs a particular resource um, has access to it when they otherwise might not. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great example. So, so what would you, what do you wanna know about that? What do you wonder about why people do or do not use case management? What, what do you already know? What do you think? Well, pulling together, other, pulling together some of the other core uh, training things, like on values, if I was to choose what values I have for a program, fiscal accountability, fiscal responsibility, like sustainability, client outcomes, staff satisfaction, those are all values which are goals for me. Um, so the question of how to achieve each of those goals has to go into the design of, you know, the same kind of what questions I have to help me map this out. I sort of have to answer towards each one of those values. Okay, yep. Great, so you're just trying to, tr trying to dig into some more layers of understanding each of those pieces. And um, just do you have some thoughts about how you might gather some of those insights and information? Um, the, I mean, I have ideas on how to start things like yeah. a shower trailer, doing outreach, trying to connect people and saying, Hey, here's free showers. Do you want to also have a conversation about case management while you're waiting? Mm -hmm. Um, as a, but that actually might not work. Like, I don't know, like in my dream world, everybody wants to sit down and has a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Mystic world. People are like, no, <laughs> I just want to shower. Uh-huh. That could so, be. Yeah. yeah. So uh I think so could be what is it? Uh diversified in my attempts. That doesn't yeah. work. Well then we can just go to 
um, you know, getting referrals um, straight from the Alliance or, you know, doing MOUs with other organizations. But I sort of want to find, I mean, my value is finding the people that aren't getting services, aren't connected, aren't going to get a referral from anybody. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, so I, it like sounds like you want to have some conversations about the conversations. So maybe talking to what, once you do reach some of those people who are not connected to services at all, finding out more from them about why not, what, what their barriers, what experiences they're having that make them reluctant to. Yeah. And that same, like all of that uh, DEI kind of stuff, like, is it because it's a white male, white straight male having this conversation with them? Like, Mm -hmm. like or a not like having somebody like a uh, lived experience being a part of that thing or um you know trying to have hphp or somebody who's doing food also there to you know mm -hmm. uh what are the variables i can control if i open up you know my closed box thinking to make this into a positive experience and then at the end of it no, that's not what you can get out of this experience surge. You're not going to get signups, but it's a good, it's a good thing, but you're going to have to do it somewhere totally different, which I don't think I'll fall to, but it's a possibility. Also, I think those are all in the spirit of this, of just being open to maybe the solution I think is the solution isn't. And Nicole's saying, sounds like you're getting to the crux of it, which is exactly right. The, the identifying some good questions to keep exploring um, how you find people who aren't already connected and and help them uh, and figure out what what you can do to help them be connected. Um, what would make somebody interested in receiving those services so that you're you're not adding to the the barriers and the um, reluctance because they're yeah. all right on target. Yeah, it just seems like the the um having this way of looking at a problem. I have lots of problems that each one of them could look at this and have pieces because I was thinking of case management as being a whole, one set process, but no, just the engagement could be one set process or, you know, so no, I, I appreciate. Um, well, that's great, Serge. And I think, I think um, you know, we had to do very quick presentations on everybody's process, but I'm guessing each of us changed not just the vehicle, but the near star and guiding star exactly for the reason that you're saying. It's like, oh, well, maybe this isn't about case management. It's about engagement. That's a whole different issue. Case management might be a way to get engagement, but maybe not. So the 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 maybe this is the answer part is really important to to question that and to think about how you would know more. And as you said, Serge, this might be different for lots of different people in different ways, but you're trying to find any patterns that, like you said, you have some control over or something that, like Rob said, something you hadn't thought about in a year of meetings with colleagues, if, if there's something new, um, some other dimensions. Um, Vivian had that experience too of maybe the vehicle that I thought was the vehicle isn't it, and there's a broader way to think about this or a different way to think about this. And that could lead you to different partners and different insights. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I just want to add to this. Uh, first of all, Serge, thank you for those comments. I, I I think all of us were sort of in that same place you're you're at, where in the beginning we were kind of thinking, how do you use this? And and you start thinking there's a lot of ways to use this. And it may be on a lot of different things. What I was thinking about is, you know, how often we're in meetings with our partners, with either internal meetings in our own agency or um, organization or we're in bigger meetings with different partners, I just thought just taking these slides, uh, I mean, the forms, taking these this process, the five or six steps, and actually doing small group work in a meeting where you take the topic, whatever the topic is, and you run it through there. And if you did that in a group, I just think it'd be really powerful because there'd be so many different ideas. And eventually you'd start to really have these robust discussions that maybe you hadn't had before. And I think these this process, these these steps of identifying the vehicle and your North Star, and to me, it's a perfect way to get alignment on your own team. 
to really start to figure out, are we all talking about the same thing? So there's many ways to use this process, I think. Completely agree. Thank you, Rob. We're very close to the end of time here. So we hope that you'll keep um, take that advice and, and uh, play with these tools a bit, share them with others if that feels appropriate. Um, but as we wrap up, this is actually our last core event of 2023, amazingly. Um, but we do have some coming up and there'll be more. So we just want to let you know about a few in January. You can get to um, registration for all of these at the events page on the core website. So please do um, sign up. And we have um, starting January 9th, a core coffee chat featuring Semillitas. Um, we'll have some guest speakers and explain a little bit about how that works and how maybe it could work for your organization. We have um, another uh, joint session with DataShare on uh, some beginners data literacy, but it's not just for beginners. And again, we'll be um, practicing together and doing a little bit of a deeper dive on DataShare, if that's, whether that's new to you or you've played with a little bit. We hope you'll join us for that on January 30th. And then in February, we're gonna talk more broadly about some different approaches to creating economic equity, featuring some local programs um, and initiatives. And we hope that will inspire some other connections and work um, countywide as well. So that's what's coming up in the near term. And as always, we really use your feedback on these sessions. We wanna know particularly, um, this, this is a slightly different format, um, sharing the learn, do, share um, community of practice. So we'd love to know what you thought about hearing about these different experiences. We hope that if we have a future community of practice that you'll consider joining it based on what you heard today and um, any other feedback that you have for us, we would love to know. And then we also hope everyone gets a little bit of a winter break one way or the other and a very happy, healthy new year. We'll see you then. We'll hang out for a few minutes if there are any other specific questions. Thanks as always to our interpreters and translators, Gisela and Stella, and to our presenters, Vivian, Heather, Crystal, and Rob, who spent a lot of time behind each of these slides um, learning with us. And we really, really appreciate their engagement, their willingness to share, and their candor about um, how hard it was for and, and how they redirected some of their work. So we appreciate all of that and all of you. Thanks everyone.